Good morning, Spotswood at Ladysmith. So glad you joined us today online. And um, I will tell you that our family, as well as our elders, we are anxious about getting back together soon. We don't know when that's going to be, but we cannot wait to connect with you guys physically and just encourage each other and may have to give fist bumps for a little while, but we just can't wait to be under the same roof and worshiping and uh, hearing God's word each week together. And so just continue to pray for our country, pray for our state, pray for our world, that God give wisdom to the leaders and that our um, life can begin to start our re-engaging soon. And so just pray for that. Also, I just encourage you to stay engaged um, with our people online. Many of you have Facebook and most of our groups have a Facebook page. Or if you don't have that, I know our community groups are reaching out uh, through mobile phones as well as texting and emailing you. So please stay engaged. It's so important. And any of those things that are encouraging to you, share those. Uh, that may be a post that's on our Facebook page or Instagram. It may be a resource that we're posting. It may be one of our sermons. Forward that, like it, send it to people. Uh, because there are a lot of people that are very anxious during this time, and we want to encourage them. So that's a great opportunity. I know many of you have said that. So I'm going to go ahead and get into a word of prayer. Oh, also before we do that as well. Also the kids' resources. We showed a video online. Uh, that's on our Facebook page. If you're a parent, make sure you go to that and, and join the group as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, all that's on spotswoodls.org. Uh, as well, or just go to any of the search, just Spotswood at Lady Smith, and you'll find those on all those uh, social media sites and YouTube. Let me go ahead and start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the message today. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time. God, I pray it's an encouraging time for us. I pray it's a challenging time for us. We need your word. God, we need prayer. And God, I pray as we finish out this sermon series today, God, it'll be a, a time of uh, real rejoicing. In Jesus' name, amen. As we said, this is our, our third sermon, our last sermon in, in 21 days of prayer and fasting. We hope that as you continue to do that this week and we close out next week with the Lord's Supper, we'll be doing a virtual Lord's Supper next week. So make sure you go out and get some juice and wafers. Um, be a great opportunity for you and your family to do that together in an intimate setting. But make sure you're doing that. Um, as well. And so um, we hope that's been an encouraging time as we finish. Hey, before we get started and I read my big idea, I want to show you something real quick. I got a hot cup of water here. It's steaming. I don't know if you can tell. Uh, I got a tea bag, so I'm going to drop that in there. And uh, it's really hot, so I got to be careful. So um, that's it. I'm going to get that started because I want some tea for later. And I'm going to set that right there. So let me go ahead and start out with a big idea. You know, we started a couple weeks ago with this idea of spiritual disciplines. And then last week we talked about fasting. Today we're going to be talking about this idea of meditating on God's word or staying in God's word as well as prayer. And so here's my big idea this morning. Meditating on God's word and a constant communication with God are two vital keys to your spiritual health and growth as a Christian. So just know that uh, this idea of meditating on God's word and staying in constant contact with God through prayer is so vital. Let me go ahead and read Psalm 1. It's a, a famous psalm. The first two um, verses, it says this, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the ways of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, I want to point out, if you're writing notes down, write this down. Psalm 1 makes it very clear to us from the very beginning. There's only two forces that can influence us, either the world or the word of God. Listen to either the world or the word of God. Let me ask you, what are you given authority in your life? The world or the word of God? Which one is it? I want to encourage you to give your authority in your life over to the Word of God. See, we have, a, we have one of our core values. It's called truth for living. It's biblical authority. And we say this, God revealed Himself through the Scriptures. Therefore, the Bible is our ultimate and sufficient authority for life. In other words, it, it provides everything we need to live the life that God's called us to live, to live a disciple-making life that makes disciples, that make disciples, that plant churches. That's what God is, the Great Commission. And so God's given us everything we need in the Word of God to live out what He's called us to do. Now, one, if you're keeping notes, write this down. One of the ways that God demonstrates His authority in our life is through His Word. 2 Timothy says this, All Scripture is God-breathed, I'm sorry, breathed out 
by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So we need to understand that the Word of God is profitable for us. Now, if you are a business leader and somebody said you could do this, it'd be profitable as long as it's moral and ethical. Or if you're an athlete and, and somebody said this could make you a more profitable player, a better player, guess what? You would do it, right? Well, this is what the Word of God is saying, that for us to truly live a life that's fruit-filled life, a life that striving is following God, we have to make sure that we have a steady diet of God's Word. So when we talk about authority, I want to clear something out up because what the world says authority is and what the Bible says authority is is really two different things. See, in the Bible, authority is not meant to control people. It's not meant to crush them or to put them in little boxes. No, the church has tried that at times and even tried to tidy people up. But the, the, the biblical view of authority is not used for information to somehow give to legalists. No, God's authority vested in Scripture is designed as all God's authority is. And that's to liberate human beings. It's to judge and also condemn evil and sin in the world to liber liberate human beings and to make them fully alive. In other words, God knows He created you, and because He's created you, He knows what works. So that, that reason, God is in the business of liberating people. And see, authority is for just that. So when we talk about the authority of Scripture, we need to make sure we understand what that means. It's not what the world says authority is. It's what the biblical view of authority is. It's to make us fully human, fully alive, imago Dei, right? In the image of God. We're image bearers of God. So to be more like human is to be more like Christ because He's the very image of God. So we don't read God's Word to find favor. We read the Word of God because we have received are found favor with God by His grace, right? So if you're keeping notes, write this down. God doesn't want you to just read the Bible. He wants you to have a supernatural encounter with Jesus. See, John 1.1 1, 1 says it this way, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And eventually it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This of Jesus as a tabernacle came and dwelt on human in human form to dwell among us. And see, as we see in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, this beautiful creation, right? Something new. And that's what God is wanting to do in us. Create something new, something brand new in us. It says the primary purpose of Scripture is and always been to present Jesus. As we've said, this Word right here, the Bible, is one continuous narrative to the person and work of Jesus. That's what it's about. It starts with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. So the Word of God is something that God uses to help us have a supernatural encounter with Him. Also this, something else to write down is this, a steady intake of God's Word increases our faith. How does it do that? Well, let's read Hebrews eleven six. 6. It says this, And without faith, it's impossible to please Him, meaning God, meaning Jesus. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So in under, understanding this, the only way to truly please God is by faith. Well, how does that work? Well, first, you put faith in Jesus, because that is God's gift of grace to us, to us and we receive it by faith. We don't earn it. We don't achieve it. We don't somehow build a ladder or create a checklist. No, we receive it by faith. So it's by grace alone, through faith alone, by, uh, through Christ alone. That is what uh, salvation is. It's receiving by faith what Jesus has already done for you. And then Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God or the word of Christ. So if we want to increase our faith, we stay in the Word of God. We, we have a healthy diet, a healthy meal of the Word of God. So if we want to please God, it has to come by faith. Well, how do we increase our faith? Or how do we grow in our faith? We do that by staying in the Word of God. So when we're talking about faith, we need to remember it goes all the way back to our very beginning of our journey. 
with God, okay? It goes back to the very beginning of the journey with God. So what we're saying when we say faith, we're saying this. We're saying we cannot trust ourselves and we don't trust ourselves. We trust God and we trust His Word more than we trust ourselves. And so many times when we're faced with challenging situations or maybe overwhelmed with emotions, this is where we have to trust God and His Word and not ourselves. Understand that feelings are are terrible leaders. They're great followers, but they're terrible leaders. And the Word of God needs to take authority in our lives. And therefore, we trust God and His Word more than we trust ourselves. See, right standing with God comes by faith. And righteousness is not something we achieve. It's something we receive. So we receive this by faith. We're meditating on God's Word. Meditating on God's Word supplies nourishment for our spiritual life. Now, I know meditating is one of those words that we don't use very often. I think in many ways it's been stolen uh, by Eastern religion, but it's a very biblical term. It's this idea of of just thinking and dwelling. So what does it mean to, to meditate on God's Word? Well, Jeremiah 15, 16 says this, Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart. And I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Think about that. So literally the word of God is like a meal. It's like a juicy steak or maybe some baby back ribs, right? Whoever, whatever kind of your favorite meal is, it's that that meal that nourishes your spiritual soul. So in other words, God's word is the foundation of our lives. Um, In the scriptures, God reveals himself and his will for us. If we want to know and enjoy God, the place to begin is in God's word. Apart from the Bible, we cannot fully know God. He's revealed Himself through the Word of God. The Word is God-breathed, right? It's inspired by the Word of God. It was led by prophets and teachers to write out the Word of God. It's profitable for, it's profitable for all of us. We need to understand that we absolutely need God's Word. It's the only source of absolute and unchanging truth in our life. So what does it mean to meditate on the Word of God? Well, that's a great question. To meditate on God's Word means to ponder on it, to dwell on it, to chew on it, to roll it over our minds, to to make sure it is applied in our life. Uh, Many, Maybe the country farmer would say it's like chewing on the cud for cows, right? Sounds a little gross, but cows have to eat. They have multiple stomachs. They have to eat it and then regurgitate it up to chew on it to eventually swallow it so it gets in the nourishment of their body. And so this is that idea of, if you will, thinking over it, dwelling on it, meditating. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says this, some people like to to read so many chapters every day, and I would not dissuade anyone from doing that practice, but I would rather lay my soul and soak it in a half a dozen verses a day, than rinse my hand in several chapters all to be bathed in the text of Scripture, and to let it be sucked up in my very soul till it saturates my heart. To set your heart upon God's Word, to let your whole nature be plunged into it as cloth into a dye. Think about that. Think about the idea of of your heart being like a sponge and you laying it down in water and being sucked up into it, right? So meditate on God's Word means to read God's Word, to believe God's Word, and then to obey God's word. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So our motivation is not by guilt. It's not by shame. It's not religious to try to earn. It's by the mercies of God. We're reflecting on the mercies of God. To present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing and acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. Now listen, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect will. Now, I've said this before from the pulpit, that if you sow a thought, right, it reaps an action. If you sow an action, right, um, it, it reaps a habit. If you sow a habit, it reaps a lifestyle. And if you sow a lifestyle, it reaps a destiny. So this idea that things begin in your mind. A man thinketh so easy, so important to get into God's Word daily, to meditate on it. In fact, um, it keeps us from sinning. Psalm 119 talks about how can a man, uh, a person keep their way pure by keeping his commands, by hiding his word in his heart that he would not sin against, against God. Psalm uh, 119, 9 through 11. And then it also keeps us focused on the eternal, not the temporal. 
I know 2 Corinthians 4.18 talks about focus on the eternal because the things that are unseen are eternal. The things that are seen are temporal. So we need to set our mind and our hearts on things uh, of eternity. And listen, it's not in a legalistic way at all. What I mean by this is we love it and it blesses us, right? In other words, it's like me eating a meal every day. I get up and I eat a great breakfast because I like food and it gives me strength. It's not because, oh boy, I got to have a, some bacon and eggs today. No, it's like I get to, right? I, I enjoy it. Now, if I skip breakfast, I don't feel guilty or shameful about it. I still got lunch and dinner. But the reality is it, the Word of God needs to be a steady diet um, in your life. It needs to be something that you meditate on it. A regular healthy breakfast is good for me. And it builds strength. And a regular healthy diet of God's Word is going to increase your faith. It's going to keep you from sinning against God. It's going to grow you. Um, it's going to produce fruit in your life. Now I want to talk about this idea of the Word of God. But before I do that, I, I want to remind us, we talked about meditating, right? Now, I put this hot water earlier up here, and I put a tea bag in it. Now, notice the, the water. I think the hot water is like a heart receiving the Word of God. And over time, it changes the content of that, right? Over time, it changes us. So it's so important to understand how the Word of God works in our life. Now, the second idea is this idea of prayer, okay? Prayer. Now, one of our other core values is this idea of uh, fervent prayer or cry aloud. And, it, and it, this is what we say. We prioritize both individual and corporate prayer out of our desperation for God and to advance His kingdom, to advance His kingdom. So we cannot do anything apart from prayer. And prayer is, is simply just talking to God. Prayer is simply talking to God throughout the day. Now, I know many of us do this in everyday life. We do it with uh, humans, right? Maybe it's our kids or maybe it's our spouse or our parents or whoever it may be, uh, some, someone we, we care about. We'll call them in the morning or call them in the evening or we'll text them or send them a message uh, through some social media app or something like that. So we're constantly uh, communicating with them. And this is really what it means to, to pray, just to talk to God. It says, pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. So what, what does prayer look like? Well, it's just sharing your heart, it's sharing what's on your mind and your heart to God. And now one of the things I, I need to reinforce and encourage you is this, that prayer should be simple. It should not be complicated. And understanding that God saves uh, old and young, He saves rich and poor, he say, says, saves every social economical background and skin color. He sa saves people from every level of IQ. So understanding this, that prayer should be simple. It shouldn't be complicated. So understanding that as we talk, we're just sharing our hearts. Some people have things that are maybe more lofty to talk about with God, and some are more simple. But it's whatever level that God has brought you to that you just need to share your heart. So let me share a couple of things that we tend to pray about a lot. Um, there's six things. One is this idea of family. We, we tend to pray about family a lot, right? We have concerns about our family. And, and then we pray a lot about uh, our future. We pray about decisions, things that are going down the road. The third thing we pray a lot about is finances. So we pray about friends, future finances. We also pray about uh, work or, or maybe schoolwork if you're still in school or maybe you're both working uh, for income as well as at school. And then the, the fifth thing is Christian concerns, our spiritual journey, or maybe we're going through a trial in our life. And then the sixth thing is current crisis we tend to pray about. So those are six things that we tend to pray about. Now, the reality is uh, there are a few exceptions, like COVID-19 is one of those, a kind of a current crisis. But most things don't change day in, day out, right? They, they're kind of like a grind. So things kind of continue to stay the same for a while. So what we see is we pray the same old things. Uh, I'm sorry, we pray about the same old things the same old way. So understanding that, that, that happens a lot in our life. We, we tend to almost make prayer boring, and that can happen because things in life aren't changing, so we end up saying the same old things about the same old things as we talk to God. But I want to encourage you, there, there is a solution to this. And I read a book recently called Praying the Bible by Donald Whitney. 
and it's a great book. And I started just probably about a month or so ago when I was out um, with my family in Colorado. And, and, and as I began to do that, it, it was really cool how I seen God work in my life. And so I want to, I want to encourage you that there are promises in God's word, but it, it says this second Corinthians one twenty. it says this for all the promises of God find their yes in him, meaning in Jesus, that it is why it is through him. We can utter amen to God for his glory. So if we're going to walk in the promises of God, we need to know the promises of God. Well, what better way to know the promises of God than to pray the promises of God, right? His word. So praying the scripture in the Bible is a simple way of keeping your prayer life fresh and alive. I want to encourage you in that. So what does that mean? Now, I want you to understand praying the Bible um, is not uh, interpreting the Bible. It's different. Interpreting the Bible, when we preach God's Word, teach it, we want to make sure that we're hermeneutically, exegetically correct in our interpretation of it. But that's not what we're talking about when we're tra- talking about praying the Bible. Okay, What, what we're saying is we, we take a verse of Scripture and we pray. We, we read it, and then whatever comes to our mind, we pray that back to God. Um, and so let me give you an uh, example. Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So a simple way of doing that is I'm just going to demonstrate this. I hadn't thought about it, but I'm just going to demonstrate it. Uh, Father, thank you so much for being my shepherd. Thank you for being a good shepherd. Thank you for loving me as you love all your sheep. God, thank you that you would uh, leave the 99 to go after the one. Thank you, Father, that uh, you now protect me, you feed me, you you take me by still waters. Um, And God, I, I pray that uh, in my life, that I'll be a, a good shepherd. First, to my wife and my kids and, and our church family. Uh, God, to friends. Uh, God, I'll be that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that's a simple way of praying the scriptures. Now, uh, you may have uh, read something like, uh, God marked on my heart. And I don't know if that's a verse, but, and you might have thought of your friend Mark, okay? So that's not exegetically or hermeneutically right, but it's what God brought to your mind. And that's what you need to pray that God lays on your heart. So this is what Donald Whitley says is this. The primary activity is, is prayer. It's not Bible intake. Bible reading is secondary in this process. Our focus is on God through prayer. Our glance is at the Bible and we turn God word and pray about every matter that occurs to us as we read it. Okay. So let me explain one other way what he's talking about. This is a little bit more a deeper understanding of it is this. Um, and again, this is Donald Whitley out of his book, Pray the Bible. I have confidence in the word and the spirit of God to believe that if people will pray in this way, in the long run, their prayer will be far more biblical than if they had just made up their prayers, right? That's what people usually do. They make up their prayers. What's the result? We tend to say the same old things about the same old things. And without the scripture to shape our prayers, we are far more likely to pray in an unbiblical way than if we let our prayers and our thoughts that occur to us as we read scripture. So while it's true that people may use this method and pray things that are not found in the text, I contend that it will happen much less if people will pray while reading the text. By this means, the Spirit of God will use the word of God to help the people of God pray increasingly according to the will of God. So think about that. Isn't that incredible? I mean, and and I will tell you that it really has encouraged me and encouraged me in prayer life. Now, I still have a list of things that I pray, try to on a consistent basis. uh, But those are things where I just take scripture and you can do that in the Old Testament, New Testament. I think Psalm, uh, the book of Psalm and Proverbs are, are great places to start. So I encourage you there. So let me ask you, I'm going to leave you with the big question today is this, okay? How are you disciplining your life to have a steady diet on God's word and to be in constant communication with God? How are you doing that? Because listen, it's not going to happen by accident. It's got to be just like a date or just like an appointment on your schedule. It has to be something that daily happens for you to grow uh, both in prayer and staying meditating in God's word. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for our time. God, I just pray that you continue to encourage our hearts. God, I pray that this message is not something that brings shame or, or, or anything like that on anyone, God, but it'll be time to encouraging people to understand, God, your word is there for us. And God, our communication to you through prayer is there for us. It's to build us up, to encourage us, to make us 
fully alive, to be, um, have the authority in our life to, to grow us um, into the men and women you want us to be. Father, I pray you'll use it just for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, as we continue to worship in music, I hope you have an incredible week. Continue to stay engaged. We love you and God bless.